Hi there. Hello. My name is Tracy Biondi, Dr. Biondi, and I'm uh, here today at the Echo Clinic. And um, apparently, we're starting with your case submission. Okay. Oh, great. There it is. Okay. So, hi, like I said, I'm Dr. Tracy Biondi. I'm a fellow here at the University of Nevada. I'm a hospice and palliative medicine fellow uh, this year. Um, actually about to be finished at the end of June, and the title of my talk is Marijuana and Palliative Medicine, Don't Get Lost in the Weed. So um, I decided to do this talk because we've had, well, several patients, but this, this patient in particular, uh, not his picture, but, you know, kind of resembles our patient. He's a gentleman who's 63 years old and had a diagnosis of metastatic lung cancer. Um, he was first beginning to experience shortness of breath uh, with minimal exertion. He had some shoulder pain and some hip pain, uh, got a CT, CT scan and was diagnosed with, with lung cancer. And he was terribly aggrieved by this diagnosis and um, he worked with the hospice and palliative care team. We really wanted to continue to provide a meaningful and satisfying quality of life for him. And his goals really surrounded um, how to control his pain. This was bothering him the most. His back and his shoulder pain specifically it was an 8 to a 9 out of 10 almost constantly. We did find that he had a metastatic lesion in his shoulder. We started with this um, World Health Organization pain ladder. You may be familiar with this. And typically you start with non-opiates. Um, NSAIDs and that kind of thing, and we did. And then we used um, uh, weak opiates, which they're calling it now in this new, new ladder, weak opiates and strong opiates. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, there are differences in potency, but, uh, but anyway, so we, weak opiates, we used gabapentin. Um, we then also ordered him to get some radiation to that shoulder. Um, and really, there was no significant improvement in his pain. And then there was about a two week period of time when his pain uh, improved when we were not titrating medication. And this is just the World Health Organization statement. They suggest that in order to be free from pain that medication should be given um, every three to six hours scheduled uh, and this will um, re reduce expenses and increase effectiveness. They mentioned surgical intervention, and I consider palliative radiation a type of, not really, but a kind of surgical intervention in this case. So we did attempt that. He told us that, you know, his pain had improved, and when pressed further, he said that he obtained a medical marijuana card from, from an outside provider, and he was treating himself with um, edible uh, marijuana. So this is what the card looks like. It really looks like a driver's license. I was surprised to, to see that. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's one of the most challenging things that we do as hospice providers, trying to manage pain. We seem to have this vast understanding of pain management, but it still feels like we just cannot get it right. We're always chipping away at the pain, and uh, we walk the line between overdosing and underdosing, and in the meantime, the patient seems to, to suffer. It can be, um, you know, overwhelming at times. And um, I think that it's our challenge and our duty to consider aggressive pain management strategies, anything that helps to alleviate suffering, especially when it becomes difficult to manage. Because our patients, they just say, it hurts a lot. You know, what can you do? This is just terrible. So here's a picture of the cannabis sativa plant. This is the marijuana plant. Um, and there have been studies that show there are a variety of compounds in the plant that are effective in the treatment of pain. In particular, I think that this particular drug is a useful arrow in our quiver, especially when we're considering multimodal approaches to pain management, to intractable pain, cancer-related, and end-of-life pain. This is the chemical structure of cannabidiol, or CBD. It's been shown to have opioid-sparing properties. And many of our patients are already using this particular drug. A lot of times they may be reluctant to tell us about it. They may have fear of legal or social repercussions. 
and the truth is, it's difficult to sometimes navigate these waters. Um, is it illegal? Is it, is it legal now in Nevada? Uh, it's important to, to know that it's a Schedule One substance. So basically, the federal government regulates drugs through the Controlled Substances Act, and they do not recognize the difference between medical and recreational use of this particular drug. Uh, it's like any other controlled substance, and Schedule One drugs also include things like heroin. Here's an example of uh, the Schedule. Schedule One have a high potential for abuse. They don't have any, uh, no acceptable safety record and no currently accepted medical use in this country. Here are some examples of popular drugs and where they occur in this scheduling. You can see that most of the opiates are Schedule II, morphine, Vicodin, fentanyl, um, some of the uh, Tylenol with codeine and anabolic steroids, the benzos are Schedule IV, and so on. Um, but of course we know the federal mar marijuana law says it is illegal, and these laws are very, very serious. Um, but this, this is different now depending on uh, the state that you live in. You can see the states that have legalized recreational and medical use of marijuana, Nevada is one of them. In November 2016, the approval of the act, or the Taxation of Marijuana Act, uh, went into place. It was legalized, and so the personal possession and use of small amounts of marijuana uh, was then deemed accept acceptable and allowed under limited circumstances. Um, which is interesting because really um, it was part of the uh, U.S. Pharmacopeia from about 1850 to 1937 when the federal government then banned marijuana at that particular time. There was a guy by the name of um, William Woodward, he was a representative from the AMA, and he really objected to this. It was used to treat all kinds of unusual things from tetanus to cholera to tonsillitis, and he thought this is really disadvantageous to patients. However, it was banned in 1937 and was removed from the pharmacopoeia in 1941. I think that hospice and palliative medicine physicians in particular have, have an obligation, a responsibility to understand and consider the application of this drug, the physiologic mechanism and how it may be a part of modern pain management. Again, here's the chemical structure of CBD or cannabidiol. And here are some things to know about it. Cannabidiol is one of the key ingredients in the plant cannabis or marijuana. The other key ingredient or main ingredient is THC, which you may have heard of in the past. The interesting thing about CBD is it's actually the non-psychoactive component of uh, the plant. So um, it makes it a real poor choice for recreational use. For, for health practitioners, it's great. We prefer treatments with minimal side effects. So non-psychoactive and um, uh, really has many medical properties, things like antiemetic properties, anti-inflammatory. Uh, most of this evidence comes from animal studies, very few studies on human patients because it's illegal. There are some trials that are in place now. Uh, but it does seem to offer some natural protection against the psychoactive component of and effects of the THC, which is also interesting. Things like memory impairment and paranoia. Here is a structure for, for THC, similar to CBD. And in the context of marijuana, you may think of smoking it. And the truth is that if you do smoke it, it's really one of the most efficient ways of ingesting the drug and experiencing its effects. When it is smoked, it distills into a vapor, cools and condenses into droplets and is inhaled. It dissolves readily in fat, and so it passes quickly through the lining of the lungs, which is a large surface area for absorption. It's not been definitively proven to cause cancer, but it is a combustive process or a combustion. And so it does have several known carcinogens similar to cigarettes like tar, irritants to the lungs. Um, one of the ways around that uh, was the idea of vaporizing marijuana. It was a way that somebody designed this way to sort of overcome some of those issues. So you are to heat marijuana at a lower temperature than combustion 
and then you can inhale the vapor, which contains the active ingredients, but without the harmful byproducts, in theory. Um, and so there have been some studies done uh, in relation to this. There was an e-cigarette study done. They tried to see if you, know, you might have some of the same effects with, with less of the harmful side effects. And really, they weren't able to conclude, to make any strong conclusions about it. Um, you know, they thought, yeah, maybe this could be a potential use for uh, marijuana and harm reduction technique in terms of vaporizing it. Here's another way that, that a lot of our patients get it in, in, in edible things like food and drink. It's very, very soluble in, in fat and alcohol, and, and it can be extracted and, and ingested in the body via the gut. Um, but this is a very, very slow, much less predictable process. Um, it does avoid the irritant effects of the smoke, but it's unpredictable because it is rapidly, rapidly degraded by first pass hepatic metabolism before it reaches the circulation. In a similar way, the only approved medical formulation is uh, Marinol, Dronabinol, which is um, a capsule containing the drug dissolved in sesame oil. Typically, it's used to treat nausea and vomiting caused by cancer chemotherapy, um, used when other drugs have not been effective. It's also been used to treat loss of appetite for patients that are, uh, have HIV, weight loss, that kind of a thing. It's a Schedule three drug, but the interesting thing about it, it is 100% THC. So that is the most psychoactive ingredient in, in the cannabis plant, and it has not been proven to be consistently effective. I just want to go back a little bit, well, maybe a lot. In the 19th century, this guy, Frederick C. Turner, he, um, there was a, it was a great era for plant chemistry, and there were many, many complex drugs that were, that were discovered, mainly the alkaloids. They were isolated and identified from plants, um, things like morphine. This guy was able to do that, although a lot of people didn't believe that he actually discovered the morphine, so he had to prove it to everybody, prove it to himself, so he decided to give it to, to his buddies. Um, I don't know if this is an actual, you know, sort of rendition of that, but I thought it was probably pretty close. He had some friends. He wanted to prove the substance he had isolated was indeed the one that was responsible for the actions of opium. He named it morphine after Morpheus, the ancient Greek god of sleep and dreams. And then, of course, cocaine. This is from the leaves of the cocoa plant. And um, atropine from Atropa belladonna, or the deadly nightshade. This plant is extremely toxic, and um, these are the tropane alkaloids. They are, um, we've derived drugs from them, such as scopolamine, atropine, but in high amounts, they can cause delirium, hallucinations. Used as pharmaceutical agents, these are anticholinergics. The, the thing that these things have in common is they are all water-soluble organic bases. So they form crystalline solids when combined with acids. Well, the active ingredient in THC is almost completely insoluble in water, had no acidic or basic properties, and it could not be crystallized. So, as you had to wait for chemical extraction techniques to improve before it could be isolated. Well, it finally did, and this is one of the guys that was responsible for isolating a lot of the com components in cannabis. He was a um, chemist out of Harvard, and um, he, was, he was well, well published, and he was able to isolate CBD, THC and several other components, but um, he was recognized for his work and then he was placed on an FBI watch list. So he was really never able to complete his work. Um, he couldn't gain security clearance during World War II, and um, so a lot of these things were just, um, you know, out the window. I think that when considering marijuana, the, the question that is most important to ask is does it have genuine medical use that are not fulfilled by other medication? Well, they did some studies, um, which this was published in 2009, and they looked at uh, a meta-analysis of other randomized trials to sort of answer some of these questions. They wanted to know, you know, what are the effects of smoked cannabis on, on patient populations, on symptoms like nausea, vomiting. They reviewed state health department clinical trials, and they found, yeah, there is convincing evidence that cannabis does relieve nausea and vomiting in certain settings. Um, there were several additional studies, pain studies. They looked at spasticity in multiple sclerosis. Um, oops. 
Uh, and so, yeah, it was great. They were able to determine that the, the results were really promising. Um, there was one study where 50 patients were enrolled and they wanted to find out if smoking cannabis would reduce pain. They found out that yes, in fact it did. But of course there were a lot of limitations to these studies. Um, one, the, it was relatively small. The size of these studies were small and it was really unclear the degree to which some of these studies were blinded. The clinical effects of cannabinoids are usually apparent. So it's really, really difficult to truly blind these studies. So let's take a little bit of a look um, at how these particular um, drugs work. There's a system that is uh, uh, in existence in the mammalian brain. It's called the endocannabinoid system. And it's a group of endogenous cannabinoid receptors that occur in the central and the peripheral nervous system. Two primary receptors are CB1 and CB2. CB1 pri primarily present in the nervous system, connective tissue. CB2 is mainly found in the immune system. Um, and a lot of tissues actually contain both receptors. In general, cannabinoids will inhibit the stimulation and both release of various neurotransmitters, things like GABA, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine. Indirectly, they will increase dopamine by blocking the action of GABA. Typically, GABA acts to inhibit the amount of dopamine released in the brain, but when it is blocked by THC, for example, there is an increased amount of dopamine released. The interesting thing is that unlike opiates, uh, cannabinoids are useful in treating appetite loss and constipation. We know that that is the exact opposite with opiates. Um, the, the constipation, even if you're on opiates for many, many years, it just persists. So what we found is the, the production of analgesia, it modulates neural activity in a manner that is similar to, but really pharmacologically distinct from opiates. They have anti-nociceptive effects in the descending pain pathways as well. But of course, it's a drug, and like any other drug, it has effects and it has side effects. As far as we know, um, there has never been a documented report of death from an overdose of marijuana alone. Um, so there are a lot of study studies to support the science of marijuana. I really believe they're out there. I think it's important to think about and talk about um, why do we care? Why are our patients using it? What is the pattern of utilization? What motivates patients to seek it out? Certainly some of our elderly patients, patients that have never even, you know, they, it's never even occurred to them to, to, to try to use marijuana. Is it really in the interest of pain relief? Does it fulfill another need? Um, and we want to really examine what makes a difference in the quality of people's lives at the end of their lives. For the most part, we know our patient's time is, is limited. We only have a certain amount of time to really make a difference. Um, sometimes we'll get a patient in from the ER, they're in extremis, they're in terrible pain, they may have been even a hospice patient at home, they were brought in by ambulance for uncontrolled pain, um, and, and we only have a certain amount of time for the patient and family to, to get relief. I think it's interesting, you may be familiar with um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, he's a famous guy, he's usually on CNN, and um, he was really against marijuana, and he did this whole expose. It's very interesting. If anybody wants to look it up, it's on YouTube. Um, it's an interesting documentary, but he has really changed his mind. He's found that, yes, indeed, there are um, uh, uh, legitimate medical uses for marijuana, and he feels that he has been misinformed along with a lot of people um, in this country. So, you know, hospice programs are also starting to catch on to this. There is a hospice in Connecticut, and they have committed to study uh, medical marijuana as an alternative to opiates. So right now they're looking at how they decrease opiate use, do they help with nausea, vomiting, do they improve well-being, do they affect depression. They're examining dosage levels, other constituents in the actual plant, the whole spectrum of ingredients. Um, and I think it's really important to also consider what shapes our belief as physicians, because I really um, feel like we are a part of this unique science-driven culture as physicians, and 
you know, we try to look critically at things. We, tr we hope that, you know, if we're looking at a study, it's a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blinded study. Um, and so, um, you know, hospice and palliative medicine, like all other specialties, we're rooted in science, but there also is a part for the art of medicine. And I think in some ways, this is a way to sort of approach your, um, your you know, how you look at marijuana because we don't have the robust scientific data that we need right now. Um, but we might want to consider it. You know, it's about appreciating the needs of the patient, and I think we're all trying to meet those needs maybe in a different way. But if your dominant feeling about this particular drug is that it's useless, you will never be able to see the utility or, or even examine the utility of this particular drug and see it as a valuable resource. So what will we focus on? How will we serve our patients? Um, this particular doctor, Dr. Wen Jen Hu, she is the professor of medical oncology at MD Anderson. She's very involved in the Connecticut hospice. And she believes that anything that can relieve pain and suffering is something that we want access to. And so, um, you know, I would suggest that uh, I, I also believe this. I would say to be, continue to be vulnerable, to be open to the uncertainty of this particular drug, and to keep in mind that what you decide to do could potentially have a, an enormous impact on, on your patients and their families. And that's it. There any questions? Doctor? Yes. Um, could we touch, go back and touch again on the Marisol? I know we've seen that ordered a lot for yes. um, persons who have lost their appetite. And did you say that that was completely THC? That's right. Yeah. Did I misunderstand you? No, that's correct. Yeah, that particular drug, which is the only um, medically approved drug that you can actually prescribe, um, that drug uh, is THC. It's 100% THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the, the psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. Because I was trying to think of instances where that affected an individual, and I can't remember ever hearing that. You know that it right. that it was used more as an appetite stimulant, but never and having you don't do that. Yes. Well, you will have that effect. Are you talking about thinking back? You don't think of any patients that have had any of the psychoactive effects. Correct. So, and part of that, part of that is because um, it's something that you ingest. And truthfully, when you ingest this particular medication, because it's, um, it has no acidic or basic properties, it's a fat-soluble drug, the bioavailability becomes really um, sort of an unknown. It depends on how much they're eating, their own physiology. It becomes really, really low. It has very low predictability in terms of how it's going to work, how much of it is going to get into the system, uh, and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but that's just the case. So it could be that, you know, maybe the patient that you have seen um, uh, just wasn't experienced that, experiencing those effects because of their own physiology. Yeah, okay, thank you. Who's Angel Care? Any? I'm just uh, calling out names. It's really it's very interesting here. <laughs> Jay Matthews, or come in. I apologize. I called you by your wrong name. I saw come in there. Any other questions before we finish up? Anyone? I'd love to hear if anybody, you know, wants to, it doesn't have to be now, but if anybody has any experience um, with patients that have either sought out medical marijuana or a recommendation or have said, yeah, I've been self-medicating. Um, I think that anytime we get this information, it's something useful. It's a, it's a data point that we, you know, just didn't have before. Would you be able to touch on topical 
um, creams and things like that. I know a lot of times people are seeking out something for a specific area. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, um, topical is also one of those things, no matter what the drug, it's very, very difficult to determine um, the, the bioavailability when you put something on somebody is, is a topical solution. And I would, I would think that that would probably be true of marijuana. For example, a fentanyl patch, which you may be familiar with, we use them often um, uh, in end of life, um, extreme pain management, that kind of thing. Um, oftentimes, we don't really know, when you put a, a fentanyl patch on somebody, you really don't know how much of that drug is being delivered and, um, and how much is, is, is it really affecting the, the pain that you're trying to manage. It has so much to do with the body habitus. Um, many of our patients, for example, that are cancer patients are extremely thin. So fat-soluble drugs will typically be better in terms of um, being able to penetrate the, the epithelial layer and then the fat cell layer, but it's not very consistent. I see. And how about for nerve pain, like neuropathy or yeah. something like that? Do you think that this is something that would be effective for that? I think that, yes, um, a CBD in and of itself has been shown to be effective in small studies, but the delivery of that drug um, is, when you, when you deliver it either through the skin, it's very, very inconsistent, and when you take it by mouth, which of course we can't do anyway, it's not something that you can prescribe, um, it's, uh, it's also unreliable in terms of how much is actually affecting or getting to where it needs to go. Um, so yes, it's really one of the, uh, one of the hurdles, if you will. Um, one of the things that confounds um, some of the difficulties with, with delivery of this particular drug. Yeah, I bet we're gonna see some interesting strides taking place now, huh? With I this? hope so, I hope so, yeah. Gosh, well this has been so interesting, thank you. Sure, thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. All right, thanks everyone. Can I ask one quick question? Yeah. Okay. So I just read an article about um, marijuana and the fact that it's metabolized mostly through the cytochrome P450 mm -hmm. um, enzyme in the liver. And I have a fair number of patients who are on medical marijuana mm -hmm. or using it recreationally, some of which are chronic pain patients who are also on opiates. Right. And I have spoken with the pain specialists about this at time. and they don't recommend necessarily stopping one or the other where some folks are hard like stops you either get this or this um i just it makes me uncomfortable because if they're using both substances just like with a opiate and a benzo you're going to have additive or different effects and other risks so i usually just try to counsel patients who are using not to drive if they're using or feeling impaired, but there's no real number that they can test for, like a DUI, and so that's difficult. Have you have you had any conversations about that? Yeah, you know, and I agree with you completely. I think it is really difficult um, because um, it, it it will enhance the effect of the opiate, um, and it certainly does have anti nociceptive properties or, or pain, um, it does help with pain management. But um, depending on how they are ingesting it, if they're, if they're smoking it, that's one thing. If they're actually ingesting it by mouth, um, it, it's just really, really difficult to know how much of the drug that you're dealing with. Because typically, with something like a benzo and an opiate, what we ideally, what we hope to do is have these prescriptions come from one provider so that um, you're aware of how much they're getting and who they're getting it from and how you are at least directing them to take it. And with opiates, you, I know, so with, with marijuana, you don't have any control over that. And you're right, they act synergistically and they are additive. And it certainly will cause a, um, a sedation. 
Um, and so I would, say, I would say, yeah, there is certainly a risk for overdose. And the best that you can do in chronic pain cases are to um, uh, just be sure that you give them the proper warning. Don't drive. Don't um, try to, you know, operate heavy machinery or however you want to say it. You know, you can't be leaving uh, young children in the charge of somebody who's taking these potent medications. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, it's tricky. It's very, very tricky. And to me, I feel like I try not to discourage people completely from using it because I believe, um, based on what I know about it, that it, it, it works. I think that it has potential for, for, for um, pain management and um, lots of other effects. And so... A lot of practitioners take the hard line of, oh, I just don't, I don't recommend using it, and you should quit. And that's fine. I mean, I think that people, um, it's really a matter of opinion right now. We just don't have any robust scientific data to support it one way or another. Thank you. Was there any other questions or um, comments or? I'm not sure we're ready to get one. Okay. Okay, so that concludes our uh, geriatric echo clinic for the day. Thank you so much, Dr. Bihani. Thank you. What?